Hi, this is the Tropical Tidbit for Wednesday evening, August 19th. As always, the thoughts here are mine alone, and in making decisions, consult the National Hurricane Center and your local weather office for the best information for your location. We continue to watch Invest 97L and Invest 98L. As we've been doing, we're going to start with 97L first. In the Central Caribbean, continuing to move westward toward the Western Caribbean. And if we take a closer look here, we'll see that uh, the system continues to be basically the same as it's been for the last couple days. A well-defined wave axis, but not too much more than that just yet. If you look at the low-level wind direction on the satellite loop, we have southeasterly wind here. We have strong easterly wind here to the south of Jamaica, and then you can see a slow drift of the clouds here from north to south. We're not quite getting the west wind on the south side yet to complete the circulation, but it is a well-defined wave envelope, and if the wave slows down a bit once it gets farther west or benefits from some of the greater background vorticity north of Panama, then we may see a closed low eventually form here. By far the greatest impediment to 97 right now is dry air in its vicinity, and we can still tell this exists because if you look very carefully right in this region, you'll see little outflow boundaries that are shaped like little lines moving toward the northwest as thunderstorms collapse and then send those outflow boundaries scurrying northward. And we know that this is due to dry air because if we look at the water vapor satellite imagery, we can kind of infer where the dry air is uh, by looking at clear sky areas around the storm. When you look at the storm itself, the thunderstorms tend to contaminate the water vapor picture by making it white, even if it's not actually moist. But if you look around the wave, if you look at, say, the eastern side, there's no real clouds here, and you can see this tone of gray. Lighter gray here means more moist. And then if we look west of the wave, say southwest of Jamaica, we see a darker shade of gray, which indicates a drier air. And this is indicating this moist pocket to the east of the wave, and then much drier air that extends all the way down to north of Panama and through the northern Caribbean like this. So this is very dry, and this is continuing to get wrapped into the wave axis as it progresses right into this dry zone. And so we're having these thunderstorms ignite within the dry air mass and then they suck in that dry air and then collapse and then have to reform again. This is not a good process for uh, tropical development. You want thunderstorms that are able to sustain themselves for long periods of time in order to generate robust um, storms in areas of low pressure. We don't have that yet, but as this moves uh, south of Jamaica and into the Western Caribbean, it may encounter slightly better conditions as some of this dry air begins to mix out and the wave slows down, which makes it easier to generate westerly winds on the southern side because it's not moving so quickly toward the west. If we look at the GFS model here, this is the uh, mid-level relative humidity and wind and our wave axis is in here on the model at 8 p.m. this evening. And we keep this going westward, and you can see the wave axis get a little better defined as it approaches Central America on Thursday evening in 24 hours or so. And then at this point, it may have its best chance right in here north of Honduras, uh, where the moisture gets much better. You can see there's a field of darker green in here on the model. Compare that to right now, where the wave is lighter green with a lot of dry air and brown kind of wrapping into it on the west side. This gets better after it gets into the Western Caribbean, which is typically a moister area, and we start getting a strong source of moisture from uh, the vicinity of South America. And so we may see the best chances for a tropical storm forming east of Belize, north of Honduras, somewhere near the Yucatan Peninsula. At this point, the wave will be slowing down because there's a strong mid-level trough to the northwest uh, that will be setting the edge of this ridge and starting to turn this toward the north, and that turn means that the system will slow down for a day or so. And there will be a couple day window here during which conditions will be fairly favorable for development. However, this trough is also going to bring its own dry air source into the mix as well as some wind shear. And we can see on the upper level wind plot at this time, early Saturday morning, this strong jet stream from southwest to northeast over the eastern Gulf of Mexico in association with this upper level trough. And the consensus is that this will put a limit on the development potential of 97 uh, during the weekend. But there is still potential here in that the storm is expected to be a well-defined wave axis during a about two-day window that favors development. And it would not be too surprising to still see a storm come out of this, even if it remains a weak one. And we'll have to watch carefully for a tropical storm to be forming here east of the Yucatan Peninsula 
I said a couple days ago it was probably about 50-50, and I still feel that's kind of about right here. Um, the NHC has raised odds of development up to 80% during the next five days. Models are a little bit anemic with the storm, but there is potential here. So we'll be keeping a close eye on that. Either way, expect heavy rains potentially moving into Central America on Friday through the rest of the weekend. So that will be occurring regardless of development. As for the potential future track of any kind of storm that does develop, this trough is very strong. So a storm will likely feel the influence of that trough and get pulled north into the Gulf of Mexico. If it fails to develop, the wave axis would likely slip westward across the Yucatan Peninsula, perhaps turning slightly to the north, but less so than if the storm were to develop more strongly, in which case it would move more toward the right. But at this point, we need to see if we get a storm forming first before we talk about any potential future in the Gulf of Mexico because there's still a chance we won't even have to deal with a storm and uh, we'll hope for that. Looking across the rest of the Atlantic, uh, we'll now turn our attention to Invest 98L, which is getting ever closer to the Caribbean islands, continuing its journey westward. And as we've been discussing over the last few days, it has been kind of a sloppy system. And that remains true today, but we are starting to see some changes. The last couple of videos I made, you saw this satellite loop with a very elongated east to west area of cloudiness. Today we don't really have that. Instead we have sort of a more confined area of disturbed weather. All of this on the eastern side has basically collapsed today and we're starting to see the beginnings of 98L leaving the monsoon trough within which it formed. We still have west-southwest winds very strong on this side and we don't yet have good evidence of southeast wind here on the east side. And that would be the sign that it's leaving the monsoon trough is if we have a southeast wind. If it's still in the monsoon trough, the west-southwest wind on the south side would be meeting east-northeast flow on the north side without very much southeast wind or northwest wind on the left and right sides to close off a circulation. If we start to see this wrap around the flow like this, then we'll know that it's in a better situation. Right now we don't know for sure what the wind direction is at the surface. We can tell from satellite imagery that there's a very strong mid-level southeasterly flow here. There is a very well-defined spin in the mid-levels of the atmosphere, but this is not necessarily a surface circulation. We'll get another ASCAT pass later this evening that will hopefully help us see what's going on down here, but for the moment there's no direct evidence of a well-defined circulation developing as of yet. This thunderstorm burst is also less impressive than it looks. It looks like a pretty decent ball of thunderstorm activity here, but what this really is is a strong and dry northeast flow to the north meeting a moist southerly flow out of the south, and this is more or less just a line of convergence here where two air flows are meeting, and this is not really a direct result or indication of a well-defined surface circulation generating that convection. So if that makes any sense, that is a less impressive uh, thunderstorm ball than you might otherwise think just looking at it. So for the moment, a sloppy system, but again, this mid-level circulation is quite well defined, and if this can work its way to the surface over the next couple of days, it wouldn't take that much to get us into tropical storm territory. And as this approaches the Lesser Antilles, we could very well be dealing with a tropical storm by the time we get to Friday and Saturday. As far as the environment ahead of it, it's going to be facing some wind shear in addition to the dry air that is present to its north. Uh, you can see a little bit of darker gray here, just a little bit of Saharan air layer to the north of the wave, and some of that will get entrained over time. But we also have uh, this big upper trough sitting here. You can see sort of this counterclockwise spin to the, the north side of the loop. This southwest flow will eventually start imparting some shear on the vortex, uh, but it's going to be even more complicated than that uh, as there are two different types of shear that 98L will be facing. And we'll see evidence of that here on the GFS forecast. This is the mid-level relative humidity and wind plot again. And the black contours are uh, sea level pressure, which give you the surface wave position where those isobars are kinked. So you can see the surface wave axis here. This is on Friday afternoon approaching the Leeward Islands. But the kink in the mid-level flow is way back here, offset to the southeast. And this indicates that the wave is highly tilted with height. And this is an indication of the shear that it's undergoing. And if we look at the vortex average sounding on the GFS at this time, you'll see that 
the wind profile, just focus on these wind barbs here in the hodograph if you know how to read that, you'll see that first of all we have the low level southeasterly flow here. This is steering the storm west northwestward and then we have southerly wind aloft and its lighter flow and this is due to that trough that we can see on the model forecast here that our storm would be about here and this upper level trough I showed you on satellite imagery is kind of like this and this is the southwest or southerly flow aloft showing up near the storm on the sounding and so this is different than the direction and speed of the flow at the surface and that's a typical kind of shear when the storm approaches the trough but there's a second shear occurring here as well and that's to do with the mid-level flow out of the east northeast as opposed to the east southeast in the lower levels this is due to the very strong saharan based high that is progressing westward along with the wave. So you have a big H up here, and this is generating a very powerful east-northeast mid-level flow north of the Leeward Islands as our wave approaches. Since the steering flow is out of the east-southeast in the lower levels, and our mid-level flow is out of the east-northeast, these flows cross, and that's another source of shear. So it's not even just the upper-level trough, it's also this mid-level flow that is going to cause 98 to struggle on approach to the Leeward Islands. For this reason, many models have dropped development of the storm on approach to the islands, and most models do not show a storm here at least as far as the global models go. The GFS and the European model are similar in this regard. The Euro still has an open wave here as well. But as we go forward in time, things may eventually change as by the time this moves potentially near Puerto Rico and Hispaniola and perhaps into the Bahamas in the future, uh, this shear will decrease a little bit. Eventually this mid-level flow south of the ridge and the low-level steering flow will align a little bit better. And if we look at the upper-level wind forecast, out to here we go out to sunday morning if we have uh, some kind of wave or weak storm here it's south of this ridge that now has light easterly flow aloft and this is more aligned with the low level flow which is also out of the east and this would represent much lighter shear at this point and once we get past the weekend the environment could be rather ideal for development or intensification of any kind of storm or strong tropical wave that we have moving through this region. Now that's assuming that it's over water. We could have a wave that moves directly over the islands of Hispaniola and Cuba, and then that would change the picture quite a bit because we'll have land disruption to the system. But if we have some kind of feature to the north of the Greater Antilles, the environment could be ideal for development. So for that reason, we're gonna to have to watch this carefully regardless of whether it struggles on approach to the Caribbean. And keep in mind, just because the, the GFS and Euro do not show a storm approaching the Leeward Islands or Puerto Rico, doesn't necessarily mean there's no chance of one. We do still have some models that show the potential for earlier development. For example, the H wharf has a storm northeast of Puerto Rico that is of you know, some significant intensity here. This is a minimal hurricane on this particular model run. The caveat here being that the H wharf does tend to be a little overzealous about storms in 98L's position. It has a history of doing this, so take it with a grain of salt, but it does show some potential for earlier development. So if you're in the Leeward Islands and Puerto Rico, keep an eye on this as this will be coming up on Saturday and impact could begin as early as Friday evening. So be prepared just in case we have a storm developing on approach to that region. And then again, down the road, we could see uh, problems for land areas farther west. This is the European Ensemble from Matt Onderlindy's site showing the tracks coming up just north of the Leeward Islands. And then you can see the colors change to more yellows and greens, indicating some intensification on some of the members as this comes through potentially the Turks and Caicos, the Bahamas, maybe Hispaniola and Cuba and down the road potentially the southeast United States as well. And this is through day five here and a lot of questions here, but it shows again the potential for something uh, that will need to be watched because of the environment being favorable. And if we have a significant system that avoids Hispaniola and Cuba, it's very possible we'll have a storm here that could be intensifying at some point during the next five days. So as we head into next week, points farther west will continue to have to watch this so have a plan ready to go just in case it is the peak of the hurricane season you should always be ready on short notice to act should a storm come your direction so just be prepared and stay safe that's it for now thanks for watching